for everything. Amen. The first scripture that they wanted us to, to go into, uh, you, could, you could pick any number of psalm uh, that was written by King David and realize that David, when it says he was a man after God's own heart, he loved to have a relationship with, with the Lord. He loved to pray to God. He loved to seek God's face. And it was interesting because when you look at the time period that King David lived, he lived prior to most of the prophets. He came right after the judges and, you know, when Saul was appointed the first king and there were certain uh, judges and, and prophets like Samuel that God would speak to and through. But up until that time, God really only spoke through his people, through his prophets, through his judges, through, and then his kings. And we know that David would, would ask God things. We know he spoke to, to God and God would reply to David. Uh, some with, with inspiration, some through other uh, spiritual means, but he would give answers to David. But David didn't have the scriptures, certainly, that we have today. We are assuming that Moses being passed hundreds of years earlier and he had written the first five books of the Old Testament, we are assuming that David certainly had access to God's delivering power on the children of Israel and how God delivered them through the wilderness and established them. So he would soak up all that he could on these. But at that point, he didn't have the book of Isaiah and all the other prophets that we have of, 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 that we can reach in and see the prophecies of those old prophets pointing to Christ as he would come. So David's relationship with God is one very personal that he didn't really have a whole lot of written material to, to study, but yet he had a, a prayer life with, with him. And if you ever look at the, uh, the, the long, they, they tell us the longest chapter in the entire Bible is Psalm 119. It's 176 verses, uh, Psalm 119. And as if you ever go home and read it, it is all about studying the scriptures. They call it his ordinances, statutes, judgments, commandments. Every bit of Psalm 119 is the, the writer is writing about his love of reading and studying and following God's word. The whole book, the largest chapter in the book is about studying and following God's word. Now, David, they picked David uh, or Psalm 63. This is a time where David is fleeing his son Absalom. Absalom has, has uh, you know, risen up against his father and has taken over and has, has falsely tried to make himself king. And David is a little bit on the run here, and he's in a wilderness of his own, which he found himself in quite a lot during his adult life. And in the verse, they've picked the very first verse of, of Psalm 63, where he says, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. These are the times where David is really running and struggling and maybe even a little fearful of what, what is expected or what's going to take place. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirst for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. There's no answers for me. There's no, there's no one I can turn to. I'm struggling here. I'm running for my life, not knowing what tomorrow holds. I am thirsting and my flesh is desiring to be with you into your presence and to hear from you. This is him expressing himself and his desire to connect with the Father so that with God, so that God can reveal himself to David and show him once again that he is with him, that God is with him. Um, you know, when we, when we see that David refers to that, you know, I thirst for thee and I hunger for thee, we are reminded that later on when Christ would come, and he would sit on the sermon on the mount and give the sermon on the mount. That's one of the beatitudes that, that Christ would state is that uh, to bless are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. If you hunger and thirst to know God and to know his righteous ways, if you are like David and have the heart of David, that when, when you're down or when you're struggling or whatever, you are ser searching and you're hungering for God's word, for God's relationship. If you get to that point, Jesus would say that you're going to be filled. It's only for those who hunger and thirst after the Lord that the Lord will fulfill. It's very easy, and that's important for us to know about the hunger and the thirst because it's very easy 
for those of us who just say, all right, I've set aside a time every day, and for 15 minutes I'm going to pre I'm going to read and pray, and I will do this at 10 a.m. every morning, and at 10, 15, I'm done. I've checked my box. I'm a good Christian. I'm, I'm doing what I'm needing to do. It's very easy because human beings are routine people. They like getting in a routine. We have a set time to get up. We have a set time to go to work. We have a set time to eat. Everything is set around a schedule and, and prioritizing personal time with God, which is important, can fall into that rut if we're not careful. David said he hungered and thirsted after him because he wanted to know more about the Lord each and every day. And that's something for us to take, take awareness to because we know that through that hunger and thirst is where God pours out his blessings. God knows our heart and he's, I'm certainly he's appreciative of the time that we have set for him but let's not take it for granted to the point where, well, let me gotta, I got to go check this thing off. I'll be with you in a second. I got to read my scriptures. You know, that kind of thing. We got to be careful because that's human nature. But in Isaiah, uh, the lesson text tells us they chose out of the 26th chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah, which came hundreds of years after King David had died and passed. Isaiah certainly uh, um, received all kind of revelation from God. And during a time when Isaiah is referring back to uh, Israel falling into worshiping idols and things of this nature, which was so frustrating to Isaiah because he continuously had to uh, judge the people based on God's word to him about falling away or, or walking away from the Lord and, and falling into paganism. He says, the way of the just is uprightness. Thou, most upright, dost weigh the path of the just. He's talking to the Lord. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. Those of us, talking about Isaiah, I have sought you. I've waited for you patiently as I seek your face. The desire of our soul is to thy name. That's my full desire is to be draw close to you and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee. The soul is the will and the emotions of, of, of the human being. Have I desired thee in the night? Yes, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early, for when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Now he's using the terminology, I desired thee in the night. We're not sure as we study this. Was the night a reference to troubled times? Uh, was it in the time in my times of distress is when I seek you the most? Or was it the fact that the night is typically a time when the mind settles down and ponders uh, what goes on in the daily events? Well, you, can, you can take that scripture and try to decipher, you know, what is, what is Isaiah saying? When I, my soul, I've desired thee in the night so much so that I'm going to seek you early as if as soon as I wake up in the morning, my direction is going to be laid before me and I'm going to seek your face because all through this night, this restless night, I have sought thy face for the answers to my questions. Both of these are indicating to us that two of the people that were seemingly so close to the Lord, David and Isaiah, saw in their lives the need and the purpose for having their personal relationship with God and spending personal time with him, even though they didn't have the resources that we have today. They didn't have all the scriptures. They didn't have online classes. They didn't have commentaries. They didn't have all the wonderful things that we have that can expound on God's word to us. They knew that they had to have a relationship. And in like today, where we know that we can speak to God and God typically will speak to us through his word. That's why we couple the two together, scripture reading and prayer, so that we can have this conversation. They relied on God revealing himself in other ways as they spoke to him. As I said earlier, there were, there were certain supernatural ways. God spoke through them through their heart. Uh, there were certain things, uh, you know, there was one time when David used a, the, uh, the, the, the dread, the, uh, over, they call it the epid, which is an over, uh, it's kind of an overcoat type thing that the high priest would wear where they'd have these stones called the unum and the thunum. And boy, that's a, that's a tough one to talk about, but it was in that he used it to try to receive information from God. That it was kind of like God would reveal himself through these stones. 
So supernatural ways, but the relationship, the desire to know God was so powerful that they would allow themselves to receive from God in supernatural ways. So we get in the book of Mark. This is where we really pay attention because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who was God himself, some would say, well, he's having a conversation with himself. No, he's still 100% man. And the man side of, of Jesus is going to have to go through a very tumultuous ministry. And we know through the scriptures, they've picked several out here today, that we talk about he sets the example for everyone that's following him, the importance of private prayer, private time with the Lord to study and to pray. And in the first one, in the, in the first chapter of Mark, he has, he has just assembled his disciples and he's gone out and he has healed all that have come to him. He's had a marvelous, what we'll call a revival, where many people have received a healing touch. He's taught them. And now as the, as the night falls, you know, they, they go to their own places or they rest where they are because the tomorrow is going to be just as, as busy as today. And we pick up with Mark, he's saying, in the morning... Rising up a great while before daylight, this is Jesus, he went out and he departed into a solitary place. He did not want to pray in the midst of everyone. He rose early when no one was rustling, no one was there to distract him, no one was, was cooking breakfast. He got up, snuck out, and went to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon... Peter and they that were with him followed after him. They see him get up. They see him go after, uh, they go and they follow behind him. And when they had found him, finally, they said unto him, all men seek for thee. Why are you going to this solitary place where we wouldn't, if we wouldn't have followed you, we wouldn't have found you. We, uh, all these people are going to wake up and they're going to want healing and teachings and all this kind of thing. And Jesus said unto them, let us go into the next town that I may preach there also for therefore was the reason I came forth. Jesus, after spending time with his father, after being interrupted by the disciples who believed in their hearts that you shouldn't be here, why are you spending time praying when these people are in need of a touch and they're, they're, they're rising from their sleep and it's going to be a full day? And Jesus, after spending time with the Father, comes to the conclusion that I'm not staying here. This is, I've got more places to go, more places to preach. If I stay here, I, the, the people in this area could keep me bound here for, forever. So I'm going to go to other places because the reason I came was to spread this gospel. I only have a short amount of time and I'm going to spread the gospel. And through the prayer, his intimate prayer with the Lord, his father, he's learning these things. Now, the men there, the disciples, they may have found this odd because you're having to ask yourself, did the disciples themselves have a personal uh, time with the Lord? We don't know. You know, if you were living back in those days and you were fishermen like so many of these, you were a tax collector, a fisherman, other men, common man. Um, what type of personal relationship did you have with the Father? Of course, you were a Jewish person, so you were aware of your local synagogue. You could go to that synagogue and, and hear the local priest teach about the scriptures, about the old, te uh, the old scriptures. You could hear about the prophecies of the Old Testament. You could hear the, 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 maybe the high priest say a prayer to the Lord. But did they, the disciples, have personal time to reflect and pray unto the Father as well? We're under the impression that they did not because they couldn't understand whenever Christ would go off and pray alone, they couldn't understand why. Why are you spending all this time here alone? And it was even a, you know, it was, it was a point where they would even eventually ask him to teach us to pray. That lets us know that they didn't have that quiet time with the Lord. And these were the disciples. They were going to take over after they learned from Christ for three years. They were going to take over and, and turn the world upside down. And up to that point, they, we are to assume, didn't have the private time that they spent with the Lord. They had to learn uh, from, from Jesus himself. We have several other times where we know that Jesus went off on his own we, right after he was baptized by John. He immediately goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights where he fast. And, you know, we know he went there to be tempted, but he also went there to draw closer to his father because of what he was about to do. Think about Jesus at this point. 
He comes up from, from the water being baptized. The Holy Spirit descends upon him. He immediately goes into the wilderness because he knows that his ministry is about to begin. The next three years are going to be just a bombardment of attacks from the religious establishment of the day. Can you think if you are Christ and you are come to fulfill the very law that these people in these synagogues have been following for over a thousand years, they have been following this law, following it to the letter, adding to it when they wanted to, and here you come and you are going to say, I am the fulfillment of this. The law is no more needed after my pri the price that I'm going to pay. And you can imagine that he knew that his ministry was going to be tumultuous and, his, and he was seeking the Lord in prayer for 40 days, fasting. The human side of Jesus knew the importance of fasting and being, getting close to the, to the Father. He was still 100% God, but the human part had to go through this. The human side of Jesus had to go through the attacks, and he had to spend time with the Lord in expectation of what was about to happen. Nothing had happened to him yet. He wasn't like David yet running from Saul, but he knew what was about to happen, and in anticipation of that, he spent time privately. We know the Garden of Gethsemane story. He knew what he, the suffering he was about to go through. The disciples had no idea. They couldn't pray with him. They had fallen asleep. They were trying, but they just didn't understand the severity of the situation. Jesus, knowing what he was about to go through, the thing that he decided to do, it wasn't to get prepared mentally. It wasn't to go to the gym and exercise and get pumped up. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane and spent time with his father in preparation for what the suffering he was about to go through. He knew what he needed and what his body and his spirit needed. So we go to Luke 6. Another time where it says, And it came to pass in those days that he went out to a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. This occasion was right before he was to choose the 12 of his disciples. We are taught in the scriptures that he had many disciples early on. Many followed Christ. Many followed his teachings, and they were marveled at his, at his miracles and his healings. But right before he knew he was going to have to develop a core set of 12, a very important decision that he was to make because these 12, as I said, were going to spread the gospel. They were going to establish the church, after, or he's establishing it, and they were going to spread it and keep it going. And he spent all night long in personal prayer with his father over what decision to make about the 12. And as we continue with Luke, we learn that he would uh, get up and, and choose the 12 that would follow him. We certainly have to understand and realize that if Jesus, the Son of God, on his time here on earth in the incarnate, bo incarnated body that he was in, had to spend time with his Father, it is an example to all of us that we do as well. It is important for us to do that even though the mind and the body will fight against us at times because the, the, the enemy will always try to tell us there are better things to do with your time. You just don't have the time for this or the most, uh, the most common one, wait until a better time appears. You can't do it now. You know, there, we have scriptures where, you know, many people got up early. Jesus got up early. Uh, Isaiah would seek him first thing in the morning. And, and you'll hear a lot of people that'll say, you got to do it first thing in the morning. And, and you know, if you can do that, great. Uh, I struggle with that. Uh, I'm not a morning person, and I struggle with that. And, and others do too. But you have to uh, understand the importance of not allowing the delays of the day to distract you so much to where you don't have any time left uh, to spend with him. There's various means. I mean, like I say, we're very lucky in this day and time to where we have so many opportunities, whether it's listening to things on, on, uh, on the computer, on television, there's teachers on, online, there's music that we listen to in our vehicles that put us in a, in a more prayerful mood, uh, that we can spend time just traveling down the road and communicating with the Father. Some people will say, well, you can't do that. That's really not a, a personal time. That's for you to decide. You know, you know yourself what, what, what happens when you utilize that time. Do you have to be, you know, Jesus told us to go into our closet. I think that was more symbolic uh, of an example than 
technically that God's only in the closet. He's not only in the closet. You, he was symbolically saying, go away privately. There's a time for corporate prayer and a time for corporate study and a time for corporate worship. But there's also an importance of going away from everybody else, getting away from all the distractions, which is the symbology of the closet, and pray in secret because that's where you connect with the Father is in secret, just you and him. No one hears you. No one has to hear you, and, and Jesus didn't want anyone to hear you. He wants it to be between you and the Father, and the Father who hears you secretly will reward you openly with what you communicate with him. So whatever your closet is, or whatever our closet may be, it's important to realize that we can't just utilize the public time that we have together as a substitute and as, a, as an all-for-all all time that we have. It's important for this prioritizing that personal time with God. And, it's, and, I, and I understand that it's, it can be frustrating because as David, you know, a man who was, whose whole heart was attuned to God, hungered and thirst usually means that God didn't come easily. You know, his attention and his relationship, when you hunger and thirst and you're seeking the Lord, you know, God doesn't come cheaply. You know, you don't snap your finger and just he arises. He wants you to hunger and thirst and to earnestly seek him for him to truly communicate with you. So it's important. Now, in, in Hebrews, the book that was written to the Jewish Christians at the time was a, was a book that was helping Jews to get away from Judaism. It was helping them to understand that you were in a religion your parents were in a religion, your grandparents were in a religion of Judaism. You followed the law to the letter, but now you've been converted by Jesus Christ into a relationship, and that's going to be a hard lesson to choose. That's going to be a hard lesson to learn, I should say, because you're going to be entrapped in the old ways of, well, here's what we do in our religion. Here's what we're, here's the day we arrive, here's what we do during the service, here's what we, this is our religion. Now you're in a relationship where it's one-on-one. -on -one. And now, as Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews is, is telling us, because Jesus paid a way for us to enter into the Holy Holies, we certainly have a, a, an easier pathway than even David or Isaiah had of having that relationship with our Father. So he tells them, take heed, brethren, be warned, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. He's talking to Jews who were contemplating of going back to the sacrifices at the temple, of going back to Judaism. They had been converted to Christ. They were still learning about relationships, and they were struggling with it. And he was telling them, it's the importance of your personal prayer time and study time with the Lord that's going to help you escape these, methods, these times of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily. Teach each other. What we're teaching today, we're talking, we're exhorting each other this morning to remind ourselves to prioritize some time for personal attention to the Lord. Exhort one another daily while it is called today. Don't wait for tomorrow. Now, everything can't be tomorrow, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What he is basically saying there is that if you are a believer in Christ, you're still in this human flesh. And if you don't grow that relationship with Christ, your heart will get hardened to some sins that may used to, to frighten you but no longer do, or some things that you used to do that were, were distancing yourself from the Lord and you knew it, but now because you lack your personal relationship with Christ, it doesn't seem as bad as it did. Hardening of this heart means that you're no longer, you're just getting involved in the motions of your religion and you learn how to follow that religion, even though your personal relationship with Christ is distancing. Be careful of that. The writer of Hebrews is saying this, for we are made partakers of Christ. We are in him. We now have a relationship with him if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Don't harden the provocation there as being rebellion. 
he's referring back to the time when, you know, these are Jews trying to go back to Judaism, and he's reminding them of their forefathers in the wilderness. He's reminding them God had brought them out of Egypt to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, had provided miracles, had watched over them, had provided for them all through the wilderness. And when it came time to enter into the land of Canaan, they listened to the ten spies instead of the word of the Lord because they hadn't, they had forgotten their personal relationship with the Father. They had gotten so involved in the routine of the day. Oh, yeah, God, that's, that's the pillar uh, by fire at night, uh, this cloud by day. He does that all the time. They got routine uh, affiliated with God to the point that they didn't have that personal relationship anymore to where they could hear his word. When they got to the border and those ten spies came back and said, man, there's giants over here. If they had their personal relationship with God intact, where they were speaking with him, worshiping with him, talking to him daily, and they knew his word, those ten spies wouldn't have mattered. Their relationship with God would have overwhelmed their fear of the report of the ten spies. The writer of Hebrews is saying, don't be like your forefathers, because if you don't spend time with your father... You will listen to the world. You'll listen to the religion. You'll listen to the enemy who will say you're okay. You go to church every week. Don't worry about the personal part of this. Don't worry about the relationship part of this. You go to church every week. Look how many people don't go to church. You're in the, you're in the minority. You're the one who loves God and God's pleased with you. All these things are great things, but it can harden your heart to where you believe that more than you believe what the Lord is saying is, I want a relationship with you. It's a powerful lesson, really, when we look at it's coming from the Old Testament to the New. In every bit of the scriptures, even all the way back to Adam and Eve's time, God didn't put, he didn't make Adam and Eve to sit there and just have a communication between themselves and him watch from a distance. Agnostics will believe that, that, that God doesn't get involved with your personal life. He established the world to roll as it is, and he looks back and down on it and allows it to happen in whatever way it, it happens. We learn in the garden that God's intent was to meet with you every day. Every day he would meet with Adam and Eve to speak with them. He, he, he longed for that. He looked forward to that. He was the one who came down and said, where are you? I'm here. Where are you? He established the relationship from the very time he made human beings. And ever since then, the enemy has tried to block the relationship. The enemy doesn't care if you're in a religion. He really doesn't. He doesn't care if you get dressed up and come to church as long as you don't have the relationship. And that's what we've got to be careful and use a lesson like this to remind us, even those of us who have waxed old with it or have gotten lazy with it, which can happen so easily, it's a reminder. And that's the beauty of the Sunday school lesson. Remind me that I'm lacking in this area. I've got to get back to this so that I don't hear the world more than I hear God. All right, next week, we're going to get into memorizing and meditating on God's Word. We're going to spend time with Him individually, so what do we do when we do spend that time? Do we just read it and say, I'm done with my chapter? Or how do we memorize? What's the importance of memorization and meditation? So we'll see you then.